It's, uh, I, people tend to think I'm a terrible optimist and, and, and uh, very um, sort of happy about everything. So it's, it's sort of intimidating to me to kick off a conference on scarcity abundance with what my friends now call the world's most depressing talk. Um, so I will try and swear a lot and dance around stage and make it seem really fun. So you all hear about this thing that we call climate change and, oh, there we go. You've heard about this thing that's now on the agenda, energy independence. And you hear about carbon footprint. You even hear about energy plans. It seems like everyone now wants to be the person whose name is plastered on the plan that um, saves the world. So Pickens has one, Obama has one, Google and McCain. Uh, what you want to know probably is how do you fit in? How do you relate to these plans? How do you relate to energy? How do you relate to the climate problem? And what you need is a framework for thinking about the very, very complex question of climate and its interrelationship with energy and power and how we do it. So tools, what you also really need, and I think we, you'll, you'll get this as we go through the talk, are the right tools for making the right consumer choices so that your life can match with what the outcome for the planet that you would like. And you'd like to know how to do it today. So I'll show you a little bit of what's on.com or .org. Um, what we're doing there is trying to solve some of the climate e energy challenges by using everyone to crowdsource the information. Um, and the talk I'm going to give you now is really some background uh, to sort of give you context for that. So I run a renewable energy company. I commute by bicycle. I thought I should know something about energy. I thought I'm probably doing all the right things. And the talk you're about to see really started with the um, how much energy is there in the entire planet? How would we solve the planet problem? And then, you know, I used to give that talk and people were like, oh, that's very fun, but what about me? So I put me in the picture. So what about me? What, how much power do I actually use? Um, this is, uh, I should mention, Jim McBride and Rafi Kakorian, who are in the audience. If you're ever lucky enough to work with them, you're truly lucky. So this is work I've been doing with them. Uh, to analyze my power use. Let's start with the basics. What is energy? So if I lifted something like an apple from the ground to the podium here, that would be one joule of energy. It's a quantity that's measurable. Power is measured in watts. So if, if I lifted that same apple from the ground to the podium in one second, that would be one watt or one joule per second of power. If I did 40 apples from the ground to this table per second, that would be 40 watts, which conveniently would be about enough to run this computer. To put that in context, um, you sitting there are using about 100 watts, me pulling this thing, which is a device we built for powering cell phones and computers, uh, does about 20 watts. Your kettle does about a kilowatt or 1,000 watts. The biggest, you know, big train diesel locomotive is about a megawatt. The Hoover Dam is a gigawatt. That's a billion watts. That's a lot of power. In 1890, the world used one terawatt of power. That's uh, a trillion or 10 to the 12 watts. And we're going to talk a lot about uh, terawatts of power, so hopefully this gives you a little bit of context for that. So how do you add up how much power you use in your life? And why did I use power? Well, you use units of power because you can add the things that you do on wildly different timescales. You can add the things you do like flying, how much power do I use for flying? How much power do I use for heating my house? That's something you do monthly. How much power do I do for something, an activity I do daily, like drink one of these bottled drinks that we'll talk about? And if you, you can calculate the power of all of those things by using sort of making time wash out of the equation, and you simply add them all up, and you get a picture of your lifestyle. This is convenient talking in power because you now think of your, light, your, your lifestyle in terms of light bulbs. So the halo behind me is not the halo of genius that they always refer to. It's actually the 120, 100 watt light bulbs that I am actually burning to power my lifestyle all the time. In fact, I'm a little worse than that. 120, 100 watt light bulbs, 12,000 watts, that's the average American. I'm, in fact, worse. So when I started out thinking I was good, I now have found that I'm a planet fucker. So <laughs> in, in incredible detail, this is how I do that. Um, and so this is about a year's work of, you know, anally retentively trying to figure out every piece, every joule of energy, every watt of power used in my life. So, as you can see, I own my own airline. This is my route map for last year. Uh, I flew about 112,000 miles. That was something equivalent to about 8,000 watts of power. 50% or more of the power that I use in my life is in flying. Driving, actually I drive less than the average American. 10,000 miles is uh, 
a little less. I think the average American drives about 15,000 miles per year. I do most of it in this uh, Honda Insight hybrid here, the most fuel efficient production car ever made. So in reality, I'm using even less than the average uh, American probably uses. The average American probably uses about 3,000 watts uh, to drive. Um, I can calculate all of the power consumption in my house. So I live in a small two bedroom house in San Francisco. I share it with my wife. Um, and you can see here, this, is, this one actually really surprised me. I got one of those little meters. I put it on all my devices. And so these little pieces at the top, these are all the little electronic devices in my life. You can even see my electric toothbrush showing up in my pie chart. <laughs> and the surprising thing in my house is that heating my house is 600 watts. So it was huge. And in fact, all of the electricity in my entire house is only 135 watts. So while I wholly encourage you to change your lights to compact fluorescence or even better solid state LEDs. In fact, it can only take a very small portion of the power out of my life to do so. Uh, in fact, there's a whole lot more energy embodied in the actual house itself. It was crazy when you, you, we set on this project to calculate how much energy in my life. And a year into it, we realized we forgot to count the energy of the house. And so it's a pretty small house. And some people have done some studies to figure out how much energy it takes to build a house. If the house doesn't last very long, it's going to be a huge amount of power in my life. But if I can make this house last 50 years, it's actually a small portion. So this is a theme we're going to come back to. Making things last a long time is incredibly important. Obviously, we all do a lot of other activities in our life, like owning stuff and buying stuff. So all of those things have something called embodied energy. That was the energy that went into making them. And that all goes on your, on your sort of power footprint, if you like. So owning one of the cars that I own is 300 watts, one of my laptops. Uh, so you know, I drop these things every 18 months. So assuming it lasts 18 months, it's the equivalent of about 250 watts. My one 300 millionth share of the internet is 167 watts. I suspect that I use more than the average American, so that number should be higher. The New York Times, home delivered three days a week, is 40 watts. One bottle drink a day, 90 watts. Owning bicycles is great. You can have as many as you like. I have 11. Um, <laughs> throwing, just the act of throwing my shit out uses a significant amount of power. Carting all of my stuff to the dump takes a lot of power. And luckily for you, I wear clothes, and it takes some energy. And uh, that's 90 watts in my lifestyle. Obviously, eating also takes a lot of power. As I've said to you previously, um, Everything I'm doing here is a conservative estimate, so I have two glasses of wine per night. Um, you can actually count that, 76 watts in my lifestyle. I'm sort of a voracious omnivore bordering on carnivore at the moment, um, and that is the, the lion's share of the power for my food consumption. Fertilizer, transportation, and farming, also very significant. Once again, I just used the one 300 millionth, that's the population of America uh, portion of that. Very likely, I'm a big guy. I eat more. I should take more of that power. So, here is in my life in absolute excruciating detail, and it's very interesting to break it out this way because you can start to compare all of your activities. And if you would like to reduce the amount of power you use, this might be the way that you actually figure out how to do it. So, the very biggest piece of the pie up here is actually your tax dollars at work, right? Unfortunately, um, and I don't know why, no one will tell me exactly how many Abrams tanks and uh, Tomahawk missiles America owns. So this just has to be sort of a blanket area um, proportional to the amount of money you spend. Because you can sort of convert dollars of GDP to watts um, and get a course estimate. One interesting thing that comes up in a significant slice of this pie that the government does for you is roads. And in fact, um, if you take a very conservative estimate, so you assume that every road in the country is two lanes wide and made out of standard materials, and you figure out the embodied energy of those roads, and you assume that they all last 40 years, uh, obviously that's probably conservative. Um, just the roads is about 300 watts of every individual in America's power consumption. So that's 2 or 3% of the power that you use, you've used before you woke up in the morning in roads. Um, other things happen here. I'm a book addict, so actually books are significant. And I can see my textiles. Um, here is the embodied energy of owning my cars. From here to here is the actual energy of using the cars, so they're roughly significant. The second biggest thing in the entire um, spectrum here is one flight to Sydney. 
So just from here to here, this is actually all my flying. Um, here is the heating of my house. You can look at the shower. So you can now start to compare things like how does my shower compare to my newspaper, compare to my bicycle habit, um, compare to my healthcare, compare to the roads, etc. So we've now generalized this to a tool. And I'm going to scare everyone by going to the live internet. Um, so this is what's on. This is something that Rafi and his team at Synthesis Studio have put together. And this allows everyone here, and I encourage you, to actually do the same exercise I've gone through and figure out in detail a good estimate for um, your power consumption. PopTech has helped us with this, as has Autodesk, to launch this tool. And I think you've all seen carbon calculators and you've heard of carbon calculators. So you know, why is this different? <coughs> the most significant difference is we're going to crowdsource all of this data. The, ca the carbon calculator problem, the calculating your energy problem, is extremely difficult. So we are actually allowing all of the users to help us make this more and more accurate with time. So this is like a carbon calculator that gets more accurate the more people use it. And uh, we can do that because now you can actually say, this is my life. So I can put all of the objects in my life in here, and I own all of those. If there's something that isn't there, I can add a new item. So I can actually, you could go here and say, oh, no one has put a jet ski in, in this database yet. And you can go and uh, estimate the embodied energy of a jet ski, add it into the, whoop, OK, well, maybe I won't do it live. But you could put a jet ski in here now and actually estimate um, that jet ski so the next user who comes along can populate it for themselves. So I encourage you to use that tool. But now to give you more context on why that is super important. I just showed you the power of me. And, and you know, was that a lot or was that a little? Well, there's, you know, there's, this is me. That was me and my lady friend. This is 1,000 people. This is all of you in the audience. You've a million people. You probably live in a city of a million people. You can't even imagine a billion or six billion people. So let's, this is a sort of a segue into what are the demographics globally of power consumption. So the United States loves to be number one. Unfortunately, you're number 10. There are nine other countries that use more power per person than America. But they're very cold or very hot places, like Iceland that uses a huge amount of geothermal. Qatar uses a hum huge amount of oil for air conditioning. Um, can Canada, you know, basically they're Americans who live somewhere colder. Um, <laughs> Australia. <laughs> well, I'm so close to Canada, I know this is dangerous. <laughs> anyway, so here's the US average at about 11 and a half kilowatts. Where is the global average? It's down here at about 2,200, 2,250 watts per person. So the interesting thing here, this is only the first 50 countries in the world, sort of graded. Not even on this screen. This is where I can do an Al Gore trick. So if we walk way out here, we'll find China at about 2,000 watts. I was told not to go that far back, sorry. 2,000 watts out there for China. Way further out is India at about 800 watts, and Bangladesh is sort of almost in last place at 500 watts per person. So that starts to allow you to put the context, you know, my 17,000 watts in context um, of the 2,000 watts global average. Um, so what does that actually mean? So you can do a nice translation between power and carbon dioxide. You can even do it as $25. I'll take it. Um, <laughs> So what, what actually happened, uh, you know, what is the consequence of using all this power? It's, it's carbon dioxide production. So let's, you know, when climate change actually happens and the rest of the world says who did it, this is the evidence that sort of points pretty strongly at the culprits. So this is the cumulative national CO2 emissions from fossil fuel burning ever since the Industrial Revolution. Clearly, and number one here is the United States. So that's a huge amount. And second place is Russia. You have Germany, Japan, United Kingdom, France, all of the big early industrialized nations, uh, huge, huge amounts of power there. Uh, sorry, carbon dioxide, very little out here. So in terms of having a leg to stand on with an argument, oh, America shouldn't act until China does, I think you, you know, the evidence would suggest that's not a tenable argument. So you've all seen this curve. It's called the Keeling curve. Al Gore made it super famous. Um, we haven't really ever been above 300 parts per million of carbon dioxide for uh, 400,000 years. And now all of a sudden, we're at 385. What does that mean? Well, so, or why does that happen? First, why does that happen? We take all of the, um, here we go. 
We take these accessible fossil fuels here. This is how much carbon there is, them, is in them. We burn them. We put about seven gigatons per year into the atmosphere. The depressing thing about this talk is six months ago when I started this data, I used a 2004 data set. It was seven gigatons. The 2007 data set is eight gigatons per year. So this changes drastically in real time at the moment. A lot of that is absorbed in the oceans, and we'll find out more about that, I believe, with the next speaker. And some portion remains in the atmosphere, because the ocean can't absorb it all, and the, the plants can't absorb it all. And so every year, this gets ratcheted up by this mechanism. In terms, you know, I, actually, I think I, I bet with my friend last night that the drinking game for this morning would be me saying scarcity and abundance a lot. This is actually an abundance of uh, carbon. If you put all of the fossil fuels into the atmosphere, you know, we have, no uh, we have no hope. So it really is not ab about not having enough fossil fuels. It's about not putting this carbon up here or finding somewhere else to put it. Um, and so what is the result of, all, you know, of shifting all of that carbon around? Uh, this is actually from the Stern Report uh, and a British publication. And I think it's the best visualization I've seen of temperature change in the last 25 years. So it really is very real. For every one of these big red dots, that's an increase of one degree Celsius per decade for 25 years. To translate, translate that into Fahrenheit, anywhere you see one of these big red dots, it's five or six degrees of Fahrenheit increase in temperature in the last 25 years. Right? So that's very, it's happening very fast. We're seeing it, and it's very frightening. So here is the big question for our time, I think. What temperature do we choose for humanity? And how would you choose it? So I'm actually really an engineer. I just want to know what the end target is and how do we get there. How would you choose that target? What you'd probably do is take, um, we hear about climate models. You'd want to figure out from the climate models where you want to go um, and work backwards from there. So this is the historical data fitted to the climate models. We do a pretty good job of predicting that now. We take these models, which are based on physics, and we put in scenarios. Scenarios are sort of social factors. The rapid growth model, this is sort of the business as usual model, sees us five or six degrees Celsius or 12 degrees Fahrenheit above current temperatures in 100 years. Even the best scenario we can imagine, the environmentally socially conscious global approach, uh, or the hippie Californian approach is what I call it, um, has us two degrees Celsius above 1990 levels by the end of the century. So even the best thing we can imagine is not that great. How not great is it? Once we run the scenarios through our models, we have things called impact studies. These are the ones that make the newspapers. And these are the ones that take the temperature and then predict things. Like at one and a half degrees Celsius above 1990, we'll lose 10% of species. At two and a half degrees, we'll lose 15 to 40% of species. We'll lose 95% of the coral reefs here at two degrees. There'll be a billion people more than the existing billion people who are short of water um, at three degrees and there'll be 10 to 100 million environmental refugees due to sea level rise also in this gap. So this doesn't sound like a great world. This big orange block over here is sort of a way you might pick a target. So if we could constrain it to 450 parts per million, the best science we have says you've got about a 30% chance of staying below two degrees, otherwise you might, might go above. So, you know, you, I think we, we need to hit a target. Business as usual, there is no target. It just is very high. Europe and the Stern Report are trying to shoot for 550. I'm going to say 450 just for fun. We're already at 385. Very tellingly, Jim Hansen, um, probably America's leading climate scientist at NASA, recent paper says 350 parts per million is the maximum you should go to. Kind of disappointing because we're already past it. And his logic is pretty flawless. Humanity evolved in a period where CO2 never went above 300, so let's not choose too much higher than that. So imagine, for example, that you chose 450, though, and you accepted the horrors of a 2 degree Celsius temperature rise. That means you roughly need to do this, and you roughly need to do this in 25 uh, years. You've got to reduce the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere to 2 gigatons per year and balance this equation with the two going into the ocean. Even with this picture, you're increasing ocean acidity, which is not a good thing. So, two gigatons of carbon, how much power do you get for that? Two terawatts if it's coal, four and a half if it's gas, three if it's oil. So remember that humanity uses a lot of power. So we chose our temperature, it, in, it inferred that we were gonna tolerate and the horrors of that. We inferred the CO2 concentration. We inferred from that the amount of power humanity can get from fossil fuels. 
Uh, that's problematic. Why? Because humanity currently uses about 18 terawatts of power. Uh, 15 or 16 is an oft-quoted number. That's because the, the companies that do those studies don't include a lot of the biomass in the developing world. Um, this is roughly how we produce our power now. But the, the question is, and obviously you can see here, right now we produce the majority of it in oil, five terawatts coal, three and a half, and three in gas. So here's the challenge for humanity. We currently use 16 terawatts, and that's forecast to double. I don't think double is realistic. We can get about three terawatts of fossil fuels, power from fossil fuels, and hit that target of 450, maybe. Um, so that's what that is. Existing, we have about one and a half terawatts of non-carbon uh, fuels. So the new clean energy we need to produce is 16 minus that four and a half, or 11 and a half terawatts. How on earth do you do that? Well, this is the only slide you need to remember from the entire talk. This is abundance. That's solar power. There's 85,000 terawatts. If you cover the entire planet with a silicon uh, that was 100% efficient, that's how much you get. In second place, there is wind. That is abundant, 3,600 terawatts. It's a very big source. Unfortunately, some of the things we think are abundant are actually scarce. If you extracted all of the energy from the moon that manifests itself in tides, you only get about three terawatts. If you extracted all the power from every wave that hits every coastline on the planet, it's only three terawatts, one-fifth of humanity's power supply. Uh, biofuels, all of the photosynthetic activity on all land is about 65 terawatts. So you'd have to use a quarter of all land if you wanted to do humanity that way. This is sort of the map that you would look at to assess energy plans. Let's take a wild guess at how we get to 2033 with an energy mix that gives us our 16 terawatts and solves for climate. So three terawatts of nuclear, half a terawatt of biofuels, just a wild guess, two of geothermal, two of wind, two of solar thermal, and two of photovoltaics. What do you have to do? Uh, and actually, just before I get to what do you have to do, um, I, you know, the reason we use power, I did, probably one reason I didn't explain this, is because we need to put different things on the same footing as carbon. If you solve for carbon, you might create a new problem. If we took very ambitious versions of the technology for wind, solar, hydro, and biofuels, um, I'm going to tell you how much land area they would take on the world. This square represents all of the land mass of the planet. Each one of these vertical rectangles represents a country. So Russia, China, Canada, USA, Brazil, and Australia. Renewistan, which is 10 terawatts of new um, renewable energy, would actually be the seventh largest country in the world. So we have to very viscerally and quickly understand if we solve for carbon, we're going to have land area problems, and we need to be realistic about assessments of like, you know, if we have enough solar power, everyone gets as much power as they want. Uh, given that, we're still going to do it because we think the compromise of renewal stand is good. What do you do? You do 100 square meters of solar cells every second for the next 25 years. That's every second you fill half of this room with solar cells, second after second. 50 square meters of mirrors every second for the next 25 years for solar thermal. For wind power, you have to build one enormous wind turbine the size of this building every five minutes and install it somewhere for two terawatts. Nuclear, it's one three gigawatt nuclear power plant every week for the next 25 years. We have eight planned in the next decade in the United States, a little behind schedule. Um, two terawatts of geothermal, that's 300 megawatt steam turbines or every day for the next 25 years. And biofuels, you'd have to fill an Olympic swimming pool with genetically engineered algae that's 3% efficiency. We don't even have that technology yet. And you'd have to fill that swimming pool every second for the next 25 years. You probably don't want to build that many swimming pools, so you fill in all of Wyoming. Right. <laughs> Hopefully there's no one from Wyoming. Is that even possible? So to solve this, you have to think radically, radically, radically different. 110 billion aluminum cans are consumed in America every year. Um, what happens if you took those aluminum cans and you said the business model of shipping water and sugar around in a can is stupid, Coca-Cola is now going to be a solar thermal company, what happens? You cut the cans in half, you fold them all out, and you make high reflectivity uh, mirrors out of them, and those 110 billion cans would represent 200 gigawatts of solar thermal. So Coca-Cola, Pepsi, all of the canning companies, they could do your two terawatts of solar thermal in 10 years. But you need to think like that. Nokia, nine cell phones every second. 
uh, Apple a couple of uh, iPods every second. You know, you take Nokia, Intel, AMD, Apple, you mu and they're all doing nothing but making solar cells, you have a snowball's chance of making your two terawatts of PV. GM used to make one car every two minutes, and they used to make one <laughs> or transmission every one minute, so maybe GM and Ford, maybe even add Toyota, have a snowball's chance of doing one wind turbine every five minutes. But it's all of those companies, and that's all they do. That's the scale. So you might say, that's impossible. This is actually, this is the super uplifting slide. Um, <laughs> so in the last 40 years, we bought online 10 terawatts of power. That's roughly what we have to do in the next 25 years. Here is existence proof that humanity can do this. Um, so that makes me optimistic. But we have to address this problem, right? The, the demographic problem, the 6 billion people, if you take our current power supply, we get 2,250 watts per person. There's an awful lot of people at the bottom that want to use more. And that really, if you want to hold this number steady at six, 15 or 16 terawatts, that means we have to use less. So I return to my lifestyle and say, wow, I really got to go on a major diet. What do I do? So I, this, is gonna be, this is actually my target to hit in three years, 2,291 watts. First step, I stop paying taxes, right? <laughs> so you now have a moral obligation not to pay taxes. <laughs> or very, more seriously, you should be lobbying government to use energy much more wisely. This really would draw into question things like wars in Iraq. Um, this is my new route map. I fly once per year to the East Coast, once every three years to Australia, once every five years to Europe. Once every 10 years I go surfing in Hawaii. It's still half of my power, but it's, it's uh, pretty drastic reductions. I now get to drive twice a month to work, once a month to visit my investors, and I lie here and say I'll visit my in-laws six times and go surfing two times. If you know me, I'll go this probably 20 times and walk everywhere else. Um, I now drink one glass of wine a night. You can come and see my hypocrisy at the restaurant up the hill. Um, <laughs> I'm now six sevenths vegetarian. It's extremely hard, but I am trying. The only power that increased in my new life is eating more vegetables so I can still ride my bike. Uh, in terms of your stuff, I think this is the mantra for industrial design, and probably most of you in the audience work at a company that sells a product. If you want to have a business in 25 years, your product um, has to last 10 times as long, and people have to own 10 times less stuff. I actually call this the Rolex problem, right? You should be issued a Rolex watch and a Mont Blanc pen at birth. It's the only timepiece and the only writing implement you get for your entire life. Um, on your deathbed, you give it to your grandchildren, and away we go. The first, you know, I will give all of my, you know, I don't have a personal fortune. If I had one, I would give it to the first company that makes an heirloom cell phone, a cell phone that lasts 25 years. We have to have that type of thing. It sort of redefines technology. Uh, quickly about products. Right now, we have these labels on food, nutrition labels. What if you did it in terms of energy? Ironically, in my renewable energy company, we have these drinks, used to have these drinks, in our fridge. If you take the embodied energy of this container and you convert it into power of your personal recommended 2,000 watt daily lifestyle, similar to your 2,000 calorie diet here, one of these drinks per day would be 4.5%. Even at my current or the current average American diet of 11,000 watts per day, one of these per day is 1% of your daily allowance. You'd probably use power a lot differently if it was this visible in the world. Um, so anyway, I'm assuming we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to do the heroic effort. It's not the Manhattan Project. It's not the uh, Apollo Project. They were science projects. Fusion might be a Manhattan Project. Fusion might be the Apollo Project. The project we have to do is much more like World War II, except this time America, Germany, Japan, and England all play on the same side. And France isn't incapacitated, right? That's what you need industrially. <laughs> so we're going to do that. We're going to put this and make energy visible on all of our products and we'll reduce our power consumption to try and compensate for bringing up people everywhere else. Ah, but we forgot. What do you also have to do? Probably the hardest thing of all is you will have to turn off 10 terawatts of existing carbon fuels in that same time period. I suspect there will be resistance to this plan. Um, and you also have to stop deforestation. You know, this is 10 to 20 percent, depending on whose account you read, of climate change. Um, and then this is my super upbeat slide, because everyone's depressed about the economy and you think it's all horrible. Actually, what's happening right now is arguably the best thing for the environment. 
Humanity currently only has one proven technique for reducing power consumption. So this is the US's power consumption increasing over time. There's only four times in the last century it went down. Great Depression, oil crisis, recession, and for the six months after September 11, when we uh, stopped flying. So the recession we have to have is great for dolphins. Now, I don't really mean that this recession right now is fabulous, because I think it's going to have a negative effect on renewable energy companies. We're already seeing that, because oil prices just dropped. But you know, maybe we can look on the optimistic side of this to bring us out of this recession. Keep this in mind. We can't bring us out of this recession increasing our power consumption. So hopefully you caught that, and I'm getting nervous looks from Andrew. So thanks a lot. There we go.